This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. And now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Carl Spetzler. Carl is an author, speaker, and consultant with decades of experience guiding corporate decision teams through disruption and transition. He is the chairman of Strategic Decisions Group. Carl, you have the floor. Thank you, Jess, and uh, let me add my welcome to everyone to today's webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, uh, Sangwon Kim. Uh, Sangwon has more than 20 years of experience helping clients make large capital investment decisions, particularly in the value chain and uh, of, of energy. Okay. His clients include large E&P companies, national oil companies, pipeline operators, utilities. He works with clients to develop practical solutions to complex decision problems. He's a partner with SDG and heads our energy practice. Sangwon, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you, Carl. It's great to be here. And we also have with us uh, Dr. Robert Hammond. Uh, a consultant with SDG and a member of our energy practice. He'll be responding to the questions that you submit and he'll pass some of them on to me. Uh, thank you for being with us, Robert. Thanks, glad to be here. Okay, and we'll start off by having a, a quick poll to get uh, some familiarity with our audience, okay? So which of these reasons is your most important uh, reason for attending today. We're in the energy value chain and participating, you're, you're basically a participant in this whole value chain. We're in a related industry, it's probably something adjacent and this is an important topic to us. Uh, I have a general interest in energy transition. It certainly is in every newspaper every day today and even our presidential candidates are talking about it and wrestling about it, or it's something else, okay? So please uh, make your selection. And uh, I believe that people can do this relatively quickly. Uh, <clears throat> let's give it another five seconds or so, and then close the polls. So Jess, if you would show us what we got. So we have a largely an energy industry uh, group of participants and then general interest participants, not so much related industries. And uh, that's our uh, primary audience. So with that, let me turn it for, uh, to you, uh, Sangwon, uh, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Um, the topic of energy transition seems to be at the front and center of everything these days. Um, not another day passes by, we see a headline on it. Uh, in the current uh, US presidential race, the Democratic Party candidate Joe Biden proposed a $2 trillion plan that promotes electric vehicles, improves energy efficiency of buildings. It eventually aims for net zero emission by 2050 through using less fossil fuel. And then there's the state of California. Governor Newsom ordered the state's air regulator, the California Air Resources Board, also known as CARB, to develop a plan to phase out the sale of new vehicles with combustion engine in the state by 2035. Under the Newsom's order, CARB will develop uh, regulations that ensure every new passenger car and light truck sold in the state is electric, or otherwise zero emissions by 2035. The topic of energy transition and reducing carbon emissions have also deeply affected the investor community. BlackRock, one of the largest asset managers in the world, has found that several hundred of the companies in its portfolio are just simply not doing enough in integrating climate change. In the first half of this year alone, the company essentially punished 53 of them by either calling for new shareholder proposals to have strict environmental requirement in place or simply voting against the election of new directors. And the emergence of energy transition also gave rise to ESG investing. 
according to PwC, majority of mutual funds will be ESG themed by 2035. Daniel Jurgen, a Pulitzer Prize winning author and energy researcher, said energy transition is running neck and neck with shale oil as the phrase most commonly used in discussions involving energy. It's quite telling that the keyword shale oil, which used to dominate the industry and is a symbol of the success in the production side of the business, has now come has shifted towards energy transition now. Well, let's talk about some companies. Uh, saying, Juan, before we really jump into this, there's a, a very basic question up front and say, what do you mean by a frame? Okay. Since it's in the title of our talk right here. Uh, it, uh, thank you, Carl. Yes, it's a frame um, is a way to define a problem and start crafting solutions. So from a decision-making perspective, we believe there are three elements that you need to have in frame. First is uh, purpose, why you're doing it. And second is perspective. What's the context behind them? What are the different views and approaches to the problem? And then the third is scope. What is the boundary around the problem and what is in and what's out? That's what we meant by frame, Carl. Good, thank you. I think that's helpful. Thank you. All right, so these uh, companies, what do you think they have in common? Well, they're all large oil and gas companies, and all of them have headquarters in Europe also. Well, it turns out that all of these companies have declared net zero emission reduction target by 2050. Repsol, in fact, was the first oil and gas company to declare such targets, and BP, Total, and Equinor have followed suit with a small caveat. EP's net zero emission, emission reduction target excludes its, op, uh, its assets under Rosneft operation, and Total's emission reduction targets are only uh, their emissions from European operations, and for Equinor, it's for Norway operation. And the list of companies that have declared net zero reduction target by 2050, just like uh, uh, Joe Biden has proposed in $2 trillion plan goes well beyond oil and gas and energy companies. And yet there's another very important commonality among these four companies. In setting their net zero emission reduction target, they included scope three emissions. Well, why is that important? So let's talk about the source of emissions. So there are three different scopes of submissions in there. The first is scope one. So these are direct emissions from operation um, of, of oil and gas production. You can think of emissions that come from flaring gas on the field um, or those fugitive emissions that could take place from operation. And then there's scope two emissions. These emissions come from energy that is used to support the operation of oil and gas production. So for example, if a oil field operator gets into a contract to buy power from a producer, power producer, who uses natural gas uh, fired power plant to generate power to supply to the oil field operator, the emissions from that gas fired power plant will be counted as a scope two emissions against the oil and gas companies. Now then there's scope three. Effectively, scope three emissions count for all other indirect emissions that oil and gas companies are either responsible or contributed to. So you can think of uh, the emissions from its vast network of supply chain, um, employee business travel emission, emissions that come from them, and uh, those emissions that uh, happen from uh, transportation of their products. But by far, actually the biggest source of scope three emissions and all of theory emissions combined come from the very product that oil and gas companies make, the refined hydrocarbon, gasoline, jet fuel, um, marine fuel, 
So these are the products that uh, uh, provide the mobility for our economy and support the transportation industry. These are, in fact, the largest sources of scope three emissions. So going back to those four, uh, four companies that have declared net zero emission reduction targets, including scope three, what they're implying is that by that time in 2050, these companies will produce hydrocarbons that are completely carbon free or have enough emissions, enough I'm sorry, offsets to uh, offset the emissions that come from the hydrocarbon products they make, or in some dramatic, drastic cases, they completely stop producing hydrocarbons altogether. That is a big change for the gas companies, and that's why including scope three emissions is important. Yeah. You know, there are some um, other examples. Um, so let's go back to the industry for a moment. See if you can guess what this company is. This company declared that they will reduce their methane emissions by 15% and also their gas flaring by 25% by 2020 from their 2016 level and has invested $10 billion of uh, capital in lower emission energy solutions since 2000. And among all the cumulative CO2 capture, they account for 40% more than any other company in the world. Who do you think this company is? You can send it through a chat box if you like. This company is ExxonMobil. All right, now let's take a look at another company. This company declared that they will lower their production by 1 million barrels per day, which is about 40% of their current production by 2030, and will not explore in new countries. This company stated that they will increase their investment in renewables by uh, to $5 billion a year, and also uh, increase their renewable power generation portfolio to 50 gigawatt capacity by 2030. Their reduction targets by 2030 for scope one and two are 30 to 35 percent and 35 to 40 percent for scope one and two and scope three effectively. Any guesses on which company this is? Well, this company is British Petroleum, according to their latest announcement in reaching um, their, uh, their five aims, which include eventually becoming a net zero operator by 2050. So you can make an argument, if you look at these, uh, that both of these companies have made considerable significant investment in reducing carbon and have some uh, dramatic plans to uh, change their portfolio to reduce carbon emissions um, in the future. Yes, uh, Carl. Uh, yeah, Sangwan. Uh, question, are there some other good examples uh, besides these two? Uh, uh, ab ab absolutely. So uh, uh, there are. there is a case of uh, Orsted. Uh, it's a, which used to be called a Dong Energy. It is a, a national oil and gas company and also an energy provider for country of Denmark their uh, significant portion of their business was an oil and gas and coal-fired power plant, and they intended um, to exit that business completely over time. And then they accomplished uh, that objective. And now um, they are a powerhouse in, uh, in building wind, uh, offshore wind farms um, in the world in, in terms of scale. And then there's an a example of Hess Corporation. Um, Hess um, has a is headquartered in the U.S. and uh, has significant uh, part of their portfolio in U.S. tide oil, um, as well as Gulf of Mexico in overseas. They have set some very specific um, near-term uh, the carbon reduction targets uh, in terms of its carbon intensity and methane and other emissions, and they also have formally adopted uh, the uh, uh, Paris Agreement goals. Um, as their formal uh, position on energy. So, so, so yeah. the question that always comes to my mind, Sangwon, is 
on the scope three, do do the the power production uh, resources still exist in Denmark? Is that coal plant still going? Was it just shifted to somebody else, or it, is it shut down? Well, uh, it is shut down, and the company actually has managed to expand the renewables um, sources considerably to, yeah, uh, to account I, for the loss. Uh, you know, you think about this BP, they're, they're getting out of a million barrels a day. That's, that's, a, that's a lot, right? That's a, that's a medium-sized oil and gas company. Well, yeah, I would say even large sized oil and gas company. The entire world uh, demand is 100 million uh, barrels per day. So it just so, uh, the figure includes gas. Uh, the but that's real question enough. is, when they get out of that, is it just being shifted to somebody else? How is the how is how are we really transitioning, or are we just shifting around? Uh, well, it 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 would uh, would take a concerted effort on both production and I think demand um, side of the equation, Carl. Uh -huh. So on the production side. There are technologies and ways to be more carbon, uh, less carbon intens intensive, and then be more carbon efficient. And then there are a series of technologies that are more commercial, and there are some emerging technologies. And then there's also question on the demand side of the of uh, of the equation, where there has to be incentive and uh, meaningful reduction in fossil fuels, so that uh, consumers have a viable alternative in non-carbon based fuel. So it would take a, a societal effort in, in pushing that. Okay. And so getting back to the uh, the Exxon Mobil and BP, so we all can say that all these companies are making some uh, the great investment and, and have made meaningful contribution to energy transition and reducing carbon emissions. But uh, listen to these statements that companies make. From their 2018 sustainability report, ExxonMobil states that emissions may increase or decrease over time as a result of the changing nature of their business. While BP states that now we are pivoting to become an integrated energy company from IOC to IEC. So while both of these companies and many other companies that we have uh, talked about have uh, uh, the uh, concrete plans to uh, for their energy uh, transition strategy, the frame that they take on energy transition are in fact completely different. So the point that I want to make is that the frames are uh, company specific and have to be customized and there's not a single winning frame in developing a strategy for energy transition. All right, I think we'll go on to uh, take a poll um, here. Okay. And in this poll, we're asking, does your company have publicly stated greenhouse gas emission reduction targets? And please select one. No, we're not considered considering setting targets. No, but we have internal targets that are not public. Uh, no, but we're considering setting targets soon. Yes, we have publicly stated emission reduction targets and it doesn't fit for us, it's the not applicable. Please choose the one that fits best for your organization. And uh, I see the polls coming in rapidly here. Let's give it another five seconds and then we close the polls. And let's see what we've got. So most of the attendees are with organizations where they have publicly stated emission targets or they're not really applicable to their business. Uh, collectively, the, the no's, when you add them up, we get to about, uh, what, 25%, so a quarter. Uh, and, and that would be uh, almost, so, so I'd say 60% or 70, 65% of the people that are where it's applicable already have a publicly stated uh, reduction target and most of the rest of them are on the way of getting there. So back to you, Sangwan. Thank you, Carl. That's uh, 
they're very much into this transition already. I, yeah, I think the framing. Well, we, we stated in the front that uh, we just can't uh, separate energy transition from the energy industry these days. So we talk about this energy transition a lot. So let's take a step back um, to think about this coming energy transition into perspective. Well, what we need to realize is that energy transition is not new, as the title says. We actually have experienced and, and in fact, have experienced very successful energy transitions in the past. There was the first energy transition, which was basically we transitioned from burning easily accessible sources to make fire and, and, and heat, I guess you can call them biofuels, to burning coal. We all know that using coal um, triggered the uh, Industrial Revolution. There's, uh, there's a steam engine um, uh, trains. There was um, heating homes from coal. And it, most importantly, industrial manufacturing that's supported by coal. In fact, the first energy transition triggered or fueled, if you will, in a better expression, the first industrial revolution. And then there's second energy transition. So when we discovered uh, uh, crude oil and found a way to um, refine it economically and started using it in all aspects of our lives, it, uh, it made our lives better um, and also created a, a, a whole a personal transportation industry to make the world more economic, economy more efficient. It also had the benefit of finding a less carbon intensive fuel compared to coal. And then there's third, which is the emergence of natural gas. Uh, while the source is, the fuel is not as transportable as crude oil, the abundance of natural gas and its reduced carbon intensity make it a very attractive source of fuel. So we made a couple of ob observations from the previous energy transitions. These transitions have occurred over a long period of time. And each one of them was driven by economic factors. They made our lives better and advanced the economy. At the same time, we can also make an argument that uh, the new source of fuel that has emerged from second energy transition and on was less carbon intensive than the pre preceding one. Although we might not have been able to reduce the overall energy consumption, thereby carbon emissions in that regard. So we established the fact that energy transition is not new and uh, we have uh, uh, successfully transitioned from one fuel to another. So it seems natural that the new source of fuel that will emerge will be less carbon intensive than the previous one. However, the uh, environmental sustainability and basically using less carbon intensive fuel in and of itself will not drive the next energy transition. It has to be economic and balanced. We should note that about the 10% of the world population still do not have a reliable access to electricity. And then we need to provide a secure and affordable source of energy for them. In that regard, several world uh, organizations have proposed a balanced approach to energy transition. In the case of United Nations, in their 17 interlinked sustainable development goals, two of them are in the heart of energy transition. Number seven, affordable and clean energy, and number 13, and climate action. World Economic Forum has this concept of balance of the energy triangle. Notice that energy sus environmental sustainability is one of them, but it's got security and access and economic development growth as another pillar. Similarly, World Energy Council uh, proposes the, uh, the framework of energy trilemma. In addition to environmental sustainability, there's a, it, uh, energy security and energy equity is also important. World Economic Forum defines effective energy transition as a timely transition towards a more inclusive, sustainable, affordable, 
and secure energy system that creates value for business and society. Now, so we talk about the uh, energy transition is something that uh, we have experienced before and we transitioned successfully, and then it has to be a balanced one um, in addition to environmental sustainability and economic and other fact drivers. It is also quite uncertain in terms of how it's going to evolve over time. So if you uh, the, the, uh, listen to the experts uh, that talk about the long-term energy demand, it seems pretty clear that they agree that our reliance on hydrocarbon-based fuels, such as crude oil or natural gas, are not going to increase over the next 30-year period. When we measure that in terms of percentage of energy demand met by these by these sources, however, if we translate that um, into amount of energy spent by these different sources, there is a wide range of variation by 2050. Some think that we will actually end up consuming more hydrocarbon-based fuels, while uh, the other uh, believes in much less so. The range of uncertainty is almost a factor of two, and there are probably some other uh, predictions out there as well that contribute to the wide range. So while we freely talk about the concept of energy transition, and it seemed like uh, the, the net zero future is very imminent, and in terms of how, when net zero will be uh, achieved, and how that impacts the oil and gas uh, production is quite uncertain. Daniel Jurgen stated that uh, although it is the subject of great discussion, there's not a lot of agreement on what it means. Some think the carbon age will be over by 2030. Others think that it will be a long transition period. All right, so we took a look at some big picture. Now let's go back to the companies. So with this mandate and pressure, if you will, to uh, reduce emissions, it, it's not like companies do not have options. There are, in fact, there are a suite of uh, solutions and choices available to reduce carbon intensity. What's difficult is to find a one or find a package uh, of these solutions that work for the por current portfolio of these oil and gas companies in a way that makes sense and creates value for them and for their shareholders. The, there's a technology related solutions. Some are more commercial than others. Some solutions are closer to operation. Um, some solutions would require uh, making some changes to their portfolio and perhaps shutting in some very carbon intensive, um, uh, the asset of the portfolio or being very efficient um, or prioritizing less carbon intensive fuel in their production. Of course, there are dramatic um, options available in stopping hydrocarbons altogether. If you have attended our webinar a couple of weeks ago, where we talk about the alternative and value metrics in energy transition and how to use DQ, you may recall this example of installing solar panel for an upstream oil and gas field. This seemed like a simple go and no-go decision, whether to install or not, but the decision maker has to consider a whole slew of uh, important variables. There's uncertainty in the, um, the reservoir performance and production. There's uncertainty in the operating characteristics of these technologies and operating cost, and they have to take into account the capital investment. Yes, standard final uh, financial investment um, methodology will include uh, total capital, production, capital of productivity and NPV, but now companies have to take into account unconventional metrics, like what's the carbon intensity of the, of the production from this field? What is the total carbon emissions that I'm responsible for? How do they impact the ESG ratings of our company? So all of those are unconventional uh, uh, metrics that companies did not have to work in the past, but now these uh, become front and center because of the pending energy transition. So if you, uh, if you are an oil and gas uh, company's decision maker, 
the decision making has a whole lot more complicated. All right. At this point, I think we'll um, take another poll. Yeah, in this one, we'd like to ask what's the biggest obstacle for oil and gas companies in finding the optimal path to energy transition? First answer is current downturn leaves little capital for decarbonization. Renewables require new capabilities and have lower returns. Required emission reduction targets are too ambitious. Internal disagreement over how energy transition will evolve. And the overall cost of technology isn't coming down fast enough. Just pick up to two of these in your uh, answers. Just the ones that seem to be the, the biggest of the obstacles from your perspective. Give you another couple seconds here to complete your answers. And let's go ahead and see what we learned. Oh, there it is. Uh, I guess we have renewables require new capabilities and have lower returns and internal disagreement over how energy transition will evolve. That is which scenario and is it better to be slow or fast on this? And then finally, the availability of capital. Those three seem to dominate this. Uh, a close one behind that is the cost of technology. But all of them are really uh, contributors, in particular, the, the top four here. Yeah, there are a lot of obstacles and a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And I think that leads you to taking a, a decision quality approach to these kinds of decisions. Back to you, uh, Sangwon, on this. Yeah, thanks, Carl. It's quite interesting that uh, uh, people thought the emission reduction targets to being ambitious is not one of the challenges um, there. Okay, so moving on. So what? We get that uh, uh, it is challenging. There are these uh, different actions and different frames and companies are taking. So how could you play in this? So there are multiple factors uh, that basically have to be taken into account. I think we alluded to uh, many of these in, uh, in my sli earlier slides. The company's energy transition goals. Is it, uh, are the targets really important? Um, and, and, and what? And how that uh, relates to the company's strategy? What is the current portfolio of the company's assets look like? And what is the, the current state of carbon intensity of the operation? What is the range of options available within the company's existing assets to reduce carbon emissions? What is the company's ability to implement technologies to reduce carbon emission? And what is the local regulatory and political environment uh, where a company may have to pace uh, multiple of those depending on where the uh, company is located. And attractiveness and suitability of investment in new energy sources, which actually may be different depending on where the company is located and their capabilities. So all of these factors will be important and will uh, help in uh, setting the successful strategy. So the challenge is getting an organization behind a, a successful energy strategy and developing a customized path. And that requires a concerted effort. And how can you start doing that? So we think uh, the first step is uh, answering these questions. So to get a uh, uh, start the framing of energy transition strategy, why does the company need to have a strategy for energy transition now? Um, perhaps the company has already communicated some ambition reduction targets. Now requires actually need to think about a realistic pathway to get to it. Um, or the company may be under pressure to set uh, emission reduction targets and the management wants to think really carefully about what level of reduction targets are appropriate, balancing multiple things, perhaps cost and the opportunities from setting such targets. Who should drive the strategy within the company? Is it a uh, strategy group exercise um, as a part of their broader corporate strategy? 
with the decision uh, senior management as the decision makers, or is it more of an environmental compliance exercise driven by government relations or investor relations team in uh, where the focus is compliance and external reporting? It's also important to know, have some decisions been already made and should not be revisited regarding energy transition? The company might have some mandates that they have to live with. Or, and also it's important the company has to consider some contractual obligations to develop or drill, for example, a certain amount of wells in their portfolio in certain part um, of their operation. What range of decision levers is the company willing to consider? Company, uh, does the company want to protect a certain core assets that are not subject to energy transition? Or is the company willing to consider some dramatic change to its portfolio and possibly consider investing heavily in, re in renewable energy sources? And finally, is the company willing to accept lower financial returns in exchange for reduced emissions? There's one view of looking uh, reducing emissions as just the cost of doing business, where value-based, uh, where calculating MPV will eventually tell you what the right answer is, versus are you going to actually actively trade off losing some MPV in exchange for reducing carbon emissions? Those are the important questions to ask and answer very early on in setting a strategy for energy transition. As part of the, uh, the framing, we talked about uh, the perspectives and purpose and skill. Uh, we often do um, this decision hierarchy um, as the, one of the exercises early on as a part of framing and thinking about what decisions have been already made and what decisions can be made later so that the company is very clear about the decisions that companies need to develop choices for. This is just the sample example, uh, sample uh, for an a, uh, uh, upstream oil and gas company uh, in terms of how they are thinking about what the boundary is for their energy transition strategy. Yes, Carl. Uh, there's a question relevant to this. Uh, you've mostly mentioned uh, multi-billion dollar enterprises that have to focus on 20 to 30 year projects. And uh, this person is asking, uh, what impact do these uh, uh, targets have on smaller companies that may have to deal with shorter term projects and often have to live or die within a decade? Well, I, it, I, I, I mentioned the example of Hess um, and even in Exxon Mobil, where they actually are drop their business with a very short term targets uh, with the uh, uh, emissions that are very controllable from their operations. It's uh, uh, the gas flaring, the fugitive emissions, and others. And uh, those apply equally for long-term and the short-term. In fact, a lot of companies that have a very long-term targets are setting the near-term targets so that they could uh, have concrete steps to get to the long-term portfolio, uh, the, uh, to get to the long-term targets. So I think yeah. it could be equally applicable to companies with a shorter cycle business as well, with a good example in Hess and Exxon Mobil who have considerable part of their business in those short cycle business. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. So, so framing is, is a, it was the main topic of the discussion today, but you should uh, know that there are other elements of, of decision quality as well. We talked about alternative and values in the, uh, in the last webinar. So eventually, once you start with the framing, you will have uh, the opportunity to think about the choices for those decisions, collect reliable information, consider those different value metrics, put them all together properly, and then have the decision makers behind the recommendation to be able to proceed and, uh, and create value uh, from the strategy. So I think that uh, so uh, concludes. We have another poll here. Where is your company on the journey to develop a strategy for energy transition? Uh, first answer is we don't see a need for it. <laughs> the second is we track GHG emissions and publish sustainability reports. We, third, we set emission targets and need to determine how to meet them. 
We set emission targets and know how to change our portfolio. That is, we have a specific plan for adjusting our portfolio. And energy transition isn't relevant to my company. It's just that because I'm personally interested. So please uh, choose the one that fits you the most. And uh, we appreciate your responses so quickly. Thank you. Let's give it another couple seconds and then close the polls. Okay, let's see what we have here. And uh, so it sound, seems to me like most companies, this 34% or at least a third, have already set the targets and are now working on their portfolio of activities and actions and projects that they can do uh, to meet them so that you're into that journey. There are very few that don't see the need. Uh, you track the, this, you're, you're certainly aware and, and measuring seems to be a significant uh, group of people, 23%, and setting emission targets and know how to get there. There's six, about 16% uh, of the answers are that we're already well on the way and we know how to get there. So this is still very much a transition. For the, the thing that I find uh, is so difficult in all this, and let's uh, go back to our uh, main presentation here uh, with Sang Wan. But Sang Wan, what I find so difficult is this scope three. I think scope three has to be settled on a societal level. To blame the oil companies, for somebody sitting on an airplane and using jet fuel and traveling. I, I just don't get it. And I don't get the current uh, uh, atmosphere where oil companies are bad because they're creating jet fuel when somebody gets on an airplane and flies. I just, it, this, this is such hypocrisy and ultimately, doesn't it require the marketplace and using the market and, and putting a, a price on our emissions of carbon, you know, some kind of a carbon tax out there? Almost every major oil company is supporting that today. That's their, in their policies. They just want a level playing field and that would harness the market on these big things and settle out a lot of the questions of what really is the, the uh, what's required here for this transition. I hear a lot of crying out, give us a little bit more reduction of uncertainty uh, from a societal perspective for the, from the whole industry. Is that your perspective? Is that how you see it? I think you said it very well, Carl. I think previous energy transitions have proven that it has to be driven by the market and uh, the coming transition will be a balanced one. Uh, there are multiple objectives to it. And then uh, if you're especially interested in the topic of social cost of carbon, I think you should uh, consider um, joining our next webinar in, in a couple of weeks where we uh, talk about the top, uh, mention the topic specifically. Thank you, Carl. And, and there, there's one more question. I think we're sure. getting close to the, the end of our time here, but should national oil companies uh, take a very different approach from the private oil and gas companies? Well, I, I think national oil companies have a unique advantage uh, in, in a lot of the cases uh, who set the policy and make the rules, as well as uh, extract value from oil and gas operations. Uh -huh. So um, the uh, I, I think there is a way to actually balance those well and um, and set some unique um, and valuable um, path. Um, so national oil companies I I think have an advantage um, in there and then go above and beyond what a typical oil and gas company can do. Well, thank you for a very interesting dis discussion, Sang Wan. Uh, let me turn it back to Jess uh, to exit and don't forget we have our third of this series 
on November 11th, okay? The social cost of carbon. Thank you, Carl and Sang Wan. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar.